Good morning, everyone. This is the damage report, and it's a Wednesday, which means it's Which also means we've got J.R. Jackson. J.R. Jackson, welcome to Big News Wednesday. Oh my gosh, so you guys held that in the box like there's a gift? You just open up <laughs> right in front of me on air like this? Mm-hmm. I need Kleenexes or something. This is awesome. It's it's to commemorate you and the fact that you make Wednesdays bigger. Uh, but everyone, I hope you enjoyed that. Apologies in advance, I sound like hot garbage. Um, but anyway, we're very glad to have you, Jr. We're gonna we're gonna need your voice to offset me sounding like some sort of creature from Lord of the Rings. John, I I took a trip to the south uh, in July, mm -hmm. and um you know it's 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 a bit of an experience. You know it's different, and not that it's the south, but it's the south. Um, it's just different things you have to look out for and understand what's happening. John appears to be okay. It looks like it's just a head cold. I am your doctor. I've been appointed by the head of the state because I said things. That he wants me to say, so I've got this new position. <laughs> uh, JR is alluding to a story we're gonna be talking <laughs> about soon. Yeah, I I went to Missouri and I did normal things that you do when you take a trip. I went out, I saw the sights, I licked a bunch of doorknobs. <laughs> I don't understand what I did that resulted in me feeling this way. But I will say, um, I, I might have got into this on yesterday's show. I don't know. My brain is boiling, so I don't remember anything. But um. <laughs> uh, I have I had really forgotten what it was like to be sick. Uh, yeah. it's not fun. <laughs> uh, my hearing is going out on one side, which is cool. I can still taste though, so I still think it's not COVID. But uh, yeah, I sound a little bit like Phoebe from Friends. So that's no, fun. bro. Normal sicknesses, even now since we've been isolated, obviously we don't get anything, let alone COVID. If you've been isolated or doing all the things, the masking. If we do that on a normal basis, you just kind of would never get sick. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Of anything, we should get used to it. Um, and the weird thing is, there are people, there are surgeon generals of whole states saying masks don't matter. But anyway, we're going to get into that uh, over the course of the next 90 minutes. Thank you, everyone, by the way, for being here. But we're going to be getting into uh, the COVID situation in Florida, uh, what Donald Trump's team knew and when they knew it, when it comes to their election conspiracy theories, and everybody's racist. No, seriously, <laughs> I feel like it usually peaks around Wednesdays, honestly. The crazy kind of local news stories of people making it so it's harder and harder for me to want us to have a society. So we've got a few of those <laughs> and Marjorie Greene's gonna blow something up. So that's gonna be fun. You ready for all that, JR? Uh, I mean, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, along the way, by the way, if you wouldn't mind hitting the like button, sharing this, uh, the stream, that would be great. And as always, we've already started getting some of your super chats. We'll be responding to those as we go. So thank you for that. But with all that said, why don't we get this Big News Wednesday started by launching into our first story. Florida's had a rough time with the pandemic from the very beginning because unfortunately that guy was their governor. He doesn't give a damn whether people live or die. And so all of the waves have been bad in Florida, especially this last one. If we bring up this chart of deaths, this most recent wave has been terrible. Despite, you know, millions of people in the state getting vaccinated, um, their government hasn't really been leading. And so many, many people have died. Now, cases are beginning, it seems, to go down in Florida, but more waves could be coming. And uh, there's been a new uh, news update from Florida that implies to me that if it does, it's gonna be just as bad as the past ones. Ron DeSantis has appointed a new state surgeon general. And well, what do we know about this surgeon general and whether him being appointed means that the state is going to be taking a different stance on the pandemic? Well, at the press conference yesterday to mark his appointment, Dr. Joseph Lopato said, Florida will completely reject fear. Fear is done, not COVID. Mind you, <laughs> COVID's not done, the pandemic is not done, fear is not done. And I will say, we, we've said a version of this many times. I don't think he was that afraid of it before. Like this doesn't actually mark a different stance. You guys haven't cared the whole time. So we're yeah. gonna get into a bunch of different specifics about this guy cuz he's a wackadoodle. But anyway, JR, uh, what do you think so far? Well, fear, in a rough is, way. fear is done and we're gonna get into the fear parts of how he's approaching things because this is the way conservative approach is to things, especially when it comes to something like COVID. It's, hey, we'd have to make sure we direct people's fears 
towards things that benefit us. We can't have people afraid of something that doesn't benefit us. And many times we manufactured ourselves again, which is why they come from this perspective of, hey, this whole COVID thing must be just a fear tactic because anything that affects so many people makes them make certain decisions about their lives to preserve it. Man, I wish we had that kind of power. That's what we like to do to people. It's yeah. like if you're only in your own world and your only perspective is that you use things to scare people into voting for you and to supporting your bad policies for their lives. If that's the way you approach things, then of course you're gonna think everyone else approach things that same way. So now fear is done. We gotta make sure fear is done. We're gonna see later exactly how they're still using fear, but even though he just said fear is done. Yeah. Yeah, and even though I'm gonna guess that he's one of those who isn't as personally afraid in part because Dr. Joseph Lopato almost certainly has gotten the vaccine. He's not that concerned whether other people do, um, but I'm sure that he has. Now he is a Harvard trained doctor who was until recently a researcher at UCLA. So um, you know that's those are perfectly fine credentials, one would think. However, he has also said many things. He is uh, opposed to mask mandates and has said that getting vaccinated is a personal choice that individuals have to make. Quote, there is nothing special about them compared to any other preventive measure. He said about vaccines. Now that is just, I like at a, at a certain point, a claim is so nonsensical, so untrue that you feel crazy for rebutting it. But that's just not true. Getting vaccinated obviously is special in comparison to other measures. It protects you at a very high rate, not just the chance that you will get COVID, but that you will get a serious condi- a serious case of it. And everybody knows that. Now, when asked at the press conference whether Florida should be promoting vaccines, he said there's been too much emphasis on that already in Florida, (laughs) where they're losing way more people in this surge than in past ones. He thinks they've been doing too much before. He says the state should be promoting good health and vaccination isn't the only path for that. It's been treated almost like a religion and that's just senseless. Mm. Okay, uh, <laughs> I I don't think that the government of Florida has treated it not just like a religion, but like a good idea even. Um, so and not okay. to say that Ron DeSantis, by the way, really fast. Not to say yeah. that Ron DeSantis has never said people should get vaccinated, and, and like he's been a little bit less hands off than like Donald Trump, for instance, where maybe. Governor Abbott or something like that as opposed to Donald Trump. Um, But still this bringing this guy on is a signal that they have not only not learned anything from the first and the second waves, they're they want you to know mid third wave that they haven't learned anything. Well, okay, so first I wanna start with the Harvard training thing. He's a Harvard guy, right? Yeah. Why do we put some, I feel like I've said this before. Why do we put so much emphasis on the fact someone went to Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Stanford, any of these big schools? Fine, I'll toss in mine. USC, why does it matter? UConn. (laughs) (laughs) Why does it matter? But the thing is we specifically focus on these Ivy League East Coast colleges. Why do we care if someone went to Harvard or Yale or Princeton and studied there? And then they're coming and saying something is obviously not based in facts. What is it about them going to college there that suddenly makes them this this uh, this person that's above any other outside factors that could just that could uh, that could factor into their belief systems or the reasons why they're doing these types of things? Just because you went to Harvard doesn't mean that money still isn't a factor in your life. It doesn't mean that power and position is not a factor in your life. It doesn't mean that you don't know what you're saying is a lie. What is it that Harvard teaches people that makes them think, "Oh my god, I'm this truth teller and no matter anything that happens in my life, I'm going to always tell the truth." Is, is there some magic the dust that, that flies over Harvard and people walk in and they just don't lie anymore? They have no <laughs> ambitions for money and power anymore because lying as we can see here gets you positions of power and money and influence. And that's a human nature thing that a lot of people just want. So as soon as you get accepted into Harvard, was he a piece of garbage in high school? And then when he went to Harvard, suddenly he's this like enlightened individual that isn't a liar anymore. What is it about Harvard? Like, can we get off of the Harvard and Princeton Mm. sucking up and act like, oh, he went to Harvard. I mean, he's lying, but he went to Harvard. Why? Well, look, the important thing on Big News Wednesdays is that we learn something new. And what we've learned is JR definitely got rejected from Harvard. And me too, I got rejected forever. But anyway, I'm kidding. No, you're totally right. And we're gonna demonstrate 
how having been to Harvard does not prove that you're not a crazy person. The thing about Dr. Joseph Ladapo is that he has written a lot of op eds. I would imagine during a pandemic, he'd have medical type stuff to be doing, but apparently he's got a lot of time for writing. I will also point out, um, I went back, I Google searched uh, for uh, references to him going back many years. And he had an op-ed he wrote immediately after the 2016 election, where he was talking about how too many people were being mean to Trump supporters. So just bear that in mind. <laughs> that said, here are some of the op-eds he has written. Back in September of 2020, he wrote an article called How to Live with COVID, Not For It. So, you know, give up. <laughs> um, what he means is how to live with COVID and sustain the great COVID Lord. He <laughs> says uh, in another one, let's all be honest about hydroxychloroquine. Evidence is more positive than many in the medical community admit. I love when you start off by saying, let's all be honest, and then you refuse to be. <laughs> uh, he wrote one uh, in October saying masks are a distraction from the pandemic reality. What? Uh, an American epidemic of COVID mania. That was released the same day. That dude's busy. <laughs> are COVID vaccines riskier than advertised? He wrote back in June, um, probably looking for a spot on Tucker Carlson. Vaccine mandates can't stop COVID spread. That was just uh, earlier this month. Uh, by the way, so those are all great. I found one that was from March 24th, 2020. So this is like a week or two into yeah. lockdowns, maybe. It says coronavirus pandemic, we were caught unprepared. It is too late for shutdowns to save us. He was saying that like nine minutes into the pandemic. It's too late, give up. There's no part to any of this. So like it's one thing if in September, October, he's like, no, the masks won't save you. Forget the vaccines. By the way, he has written positively about ivermectin. So um, check that off on your, your wackadoodle bingo. <laughs> uh, he was immediately surrendering to the pandemic. Like we joke about this a lot, but what would it look like if you honestly worshiped COVID as your Lord and Savior, and you just wanted it to be strong, you wanted it to be fed, you wanted to just shovel people into its maw day after day, I would argue it would look kind of like this. What do well, you think that's there? that's the way it works. That's the way they approach these things. Again, there's alternative reasons why they're doing these things. He doesn't believe in any of this stuff. He's Harvard educated, so he doesn't believe in all this <laughs> Which stuff. You mean something? <laughs> you know a lot. <laughs> so we're talking about. Remember earlier. So what will happen a lot of times? You'll get some. Uh, you'll always get these conflicts of arguments that they'll have because if you don't have a cohesive argument that makes any sense for the for the end game of what you're proposing, you're gonna hit some road bumps here. So he said. Remember earlier he said fear, fear. It's over. We're done with fear. But this headline says, are COVID vaccines riskier than advertised? That would induce some fear in people. Yeah. Vaccine mandates can't stop COVID spread. Oh my God! I shouldn't get the the vaccine. Because it can't stop the spread anyway. These sound like fear tactics to me. It's weird how suddenly fear is gone until I need it for my agenda and my objectives here to make sure people yeah. continue down the same road. Now that whole thing about in March of March of 2020 when he was already given up, that was again based in the reason they want to keep things open is for more money, for more yeah. flow to these to the businesses and stuff that they want to have open and people dying as a result of it. Okay, money though. That's the, the, these are one of the objectives that they have here. And so from the very beginning, as soon as there's this threat to ending anything in business like or, or money flowing through these certain people's bank accounts, oh man, it's over, it's yeah. stop, it's over already. Yeah, yeah, look, I think those sorts of economic concerns have driven a lot of politicians and not just Republicans. I think uh, Democrats you know, wanting everyone to get uh, immunized isn't totally disconnected from wanting the economy to be up yeah, and running once absolutely. again. But I would argue, at least that seems like it might work. You cannot just pretend that this doesn't exist. We'll not do that and not lose tons of people as Florida has. By the end of let's say today, they'll have lost 52,000 people just mm -hmm. in Florida. How many of those people needed to die? Do you mm -hmm. honestly think it's 10,000 that absolutely had to die if they'd done what they could have done? But no, they, they've got people like this. They've got Ron DeSantis and they're sticking with him. Someone said this guy, Dr. Joseph Lopato, makes the demon semen woman look credible. Well, do you think there's not a connection there? Because I found one. He actually <laughs> spoke right before her at the thing that you're thinking of. When she gave that speech and suddenly became you know a national figure briefly and we all figured out how crazy she was. 
He was the lead in speech for her at that. Harvard educated. But anyway, really fast, I do also want to let you know is we, we've been sort of speculating about what effect him being the Surgeon General might have or what signals it might send about Florida's commitment to doing more when it comes to COVID. Well, you should bear in mind that back in October 2020, uh, Ladapo boasted about his support for the so called Great Barrington Declaration that endorsed protections for the elderly and those with compromised immune systems, while simultaneously arguing that the authorities should pursue herd immunity by allowing the deadly virus to spread <laughs> untrammeled. Man, that word doesn't get enough play through the rest of the population. So it wasn't just, I'm not just speculating that on March 24th he wanted to give up. His actual stance is let's just let people get COVID. So that was back in October. So when you see all these op eds that are saying masks won't really save you, or do you really need to get vaccinated? Bear in mind, this guy wants you to get COVID. That is his strategy. Let it spread. Some will die, sure, tons needlessly, but then eventually there will be some fraction of our population left, and then we'll be back to normal. That is actually a plan that he signed on to. Remember all the criticism we made of people like Donald Trump? And Scott Atlas, Ladapo is one of those people. This is the way it goes. It doesn't. It's it's based off the moment in time. There first, it's well, not even who knows which came first, the chicken or the egg. But here, it's which one is going to be. So we're going to say master ineffective and all that stuff. But then we find out previous to that, he was talking about he just wants everyone to be infected. These two things can't be part of your argument if you're trying to tell people the direct best way to go. Either you're completely honest with them and you say this is what I want. Your grandmother might die. Your brother might die, your uncle might die, you might die. But that's for the greater good because this is where to go with this herd yep. immunity thing. You notice whenever they pitch the herd immunity stuff, they never say it directly to the person they're talking to. Hey, so um, you're probably gonna die, so that's <laughs> okay. And most people would be like, no, because their thought is, is hey, let's go with this herd immunity thing because I'm not gonna die. Yeah. All those other people are gonna die. We have this dismissal of other people's lives as long as it's not ours and no one ever thinks it's gonna affect them. Yeah, we think we'll be fine. We're a nation that plays the lotto. Like we think the odds of great things happening to us are larger than they are and bad things happening to us are lower than they are. Bad bad things happen and 52,000 of those bad things have already happened in Florida. I have no idea where they'll end up. Are you sure that in a year, we we won't be doing a big news Wednesday about the seventh COVID surge and how it's once again taking like 300, 400 Floridians a day. Are you sure of that? I don't think that's gonna happen because eventually everyone will have gotten vaccinated or more likely gotten COVID. But I certainly don't rule it out as a possibility. In any mm. event, uh, well, any, any closing thoughts? No, no, I'm done. Okay. okay. Well, unfortunately, COVID's not because it has got some very powerful allies. In any event, we're going to take our first break. When we come back, we're going to dive into some of the lies about the election, new revelations about when the Trump team actually knew that what they were saying were lies. And Sidney Powell is back making past incarnations of herself seem reasonable by comparison. We'll have that for you after this. <laughs> Okay, everybody, let's, oh my God, I hadn't read this live read in advance. New members only show featuring Senator Nina Turner debuts this Thursday. Tune into Power Hour with Nina Turner, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific Time, Thursdays. I knew that that was gonna come at some point. I thought that was still months away, so that's exciting. <laughs> um, so Power Hour on Thursdays. I wonder, does that affect the Friday Power Panel? Are we getting too powerful? I'm worried about that. I hope we're using renewable energy for all this power. Anyway, uh, Nina Turner will also be doing an interview with Dr. Cornell West on the conversation. Jeez, this is an exciting reads box. <laughs> uh, that'll be happening 5:30 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, that would be that's today, right? Yeah, conversations today. Yes. So uh, Nina Turner, uh, Cornell West. That should be an exciting conversation. Uh, that's awesome. Okay, uh, more announcements to come. Uh, but why don't we jump back into the news? <laughs> So we know that immediately after Donald Trump was clearly the loser in the 2020 election, they began a multi-phase attempt to overturn the election. That came in a variety of forms, personal accusations that the election had been stolen, attempts in the legal system to change the outcome, 
attempts by state legislatures to overturn the results. And then of course, what happened in DC. But what you need to know is that many of the foundational lies that drove all of those different phases, things about Smartmatic and Dominion and big dumps, those sorts of things, <laughs> they knew immediately that they weren't true. So it started relatively fast, two weeks after the election, a team of lawyers, lawyers closely allied with Donald J. Trump uh, held a widely watched news conference at the Republican Party's headquarters in Washington. I believe that was the one with um, Sidney Powell and Ellis and Giuliani. At that event, they laid out a conspiracy theory claiming that a voting machine company had worked with an election software firm, the financier George Soros and Venezuela, because why not, to steal the election. But here is the issue, before they'd even done that conference, let alone the dozens of court cases that they would eventually go on to lose whilst farting COVID onto each other. Um, they had already had a memo, an internal memo that rebutted most of those claims about Dominion and about Smartmatic. So that memo is now available online. You can go and you can find not only uh, the summaries of what claims had already been determined by Trump's team to be untrue. This is an internal memo to Trump's team, but also all of the research they had done, uh, tons of links about how they demonstrated what's true and what's not. But the, the overall most important points are that the memo found that Dominion did not use voting technology from the software company Smartmatic in 2020. Uh, that Dominion had no direct ties to Venezuela or to George Soros. And that there was no evidence that Dominion's leadership had connections to left wing Antifa activists. But that did not stop them, not just <laughs> from up until then making those claims, but making those claims until literally this week, they are still doing it. We're gonna give you those, uh, some of those citations. But uh, JR, I am imagining you're not gonna be super surprised that they knew that these were lies when they told them. This is the basis for all the, not all of them, but many of the conversations that people have about, man, are they just that dumb? Or you know, are they just trying to pull the wool over our eyes and they know that they're lying? No, no, they always know that they're lying. Again, we talked about the new Surgeon General of the state in Florida, the head of all the doctors there who went to Harvard. He knows what he's talking about, but they know what they're doing. And then afterwards, they craft an entire thing to look exactly the opposite. Because mm -hmm. there's no service from our politicians at this point. We're not, they're not trying to serve us based off of reality. They're trying to serve our us, their reality, so they can get voted in again. It just has yeah. nothing to do with reality anymore. So if, if you come across some evidence, that refutes what you're thinking, you have to go, oh, okay, well, let's, let's ignore that really quick. Let's go ahead and move on with that because it's not gonna get you anywhere. You've already dug in this deep. How how anticlimactic would it be if then a day before they have their press conference, they go, so you guys, we had this, a bunch of lies that were <laughs> teed up for us to tell you. And um, you know what, we found out that it's, it's not true. So um, we're gonna go <laughs> home, <laughs> that's it. Yeah, the only thing I would add is, you're totally right. They tell the the lies, you know, generally to get reelected. But in this case, you have all the wrong incentives. You have lawyers with no ethics telling lies so that they can continue to get paid, or at least think that they're going to get paid. They were working for Trump, and so like <laughs> Giuliani ain't getting paid, but he thought he would. Um, you have the lies being told by members of the campaign uh, for a couple of different reasons. One, so they can continue to raise massive amounts of money. They were using these lies as they were doing their text blast, asking for people to donate money and all that. But also to lay to to put just enough cover over the, for instance, state legislature attempts to overturn election results. Um, it's not that they're demonstrating anything that they're saying, but they have to say something. There has to at least for their base seem to be some sort of a case to be made. And so there were a lot of incentives moving in the wrong directions that led to them telling lies that they knew were lies when they told them. Now, to be fair, Miss Powell and Mr. Giuliani have not responded to messages seeking comment on the internal memo. Representatives for Mr. Trump also did not respond to emails. Although it is not yet established whether Donald Trump himself ever saw this memo. The legal team did, the team did, his you know, goons and mooks and all of that did. We don't know if Trump did, but if he'd seen it, he wouldn't have read it anyway. So exactly. what's the difference? Exactly, 100%. Um, now, what we do know though is that Giuliani in a deposition referenced the memo saying they wanted Trump to lose because they could raise more money. So what he means there is the people who put together the memo, despite listing all of the evidence that led to their conclusions, were lying to the legal team 
so that Trump would lose the election, which he'd already lost, so that those researchers could raise more money. That's not just projection, it's nonsensical projection because of course they are trying to raise money. Who are the researchers and how are the researchers raising money? That doesn't even make any sense. And what for? What are they running for? Research office, like what I don't know, raising money or just again fundraising. And these guys isn't about taking in money to then use for this other good, like maybe a campaign. <laughs> researching, I mean not researching, campaigning or fundraising for them is, oh let's get some money from people and then after yeah. we get all that money, let's put it in our pockets. That's that's fundraising to Rudy Giuliani because they're just trying to fundraise, take some of the money that we could have been pilfering from people. Yeah, they're getting it now. Maybe. Anyway, so look, that was that was way back in November of last year. More recently, a lawyer for Mr. Giuliani said in a court filing last month that at least some of his claims of election fraud were quote substantially true, which is which is not only untrue in it by itself, but that's also a really pathetic thing to say. Like, come on, some of the stuff I said was true. I said at a lot least, of things. Some of them were true. At least some of it. <laughs> That is really pathetic. Um, as recently as just three weeks ago, uh, Sidney Powell told a reporter for the Australian Broadcasting Corporation that the 2020 election was, quote, essentially a bloodless coup where they took over the presidency of the United States without a single shot being fired. Now, hold on to that thought because she has moved on from that position in the last three weeks and does not believe that it was bloodless anymore. We'll get to that in a little bit. But they are still telling these lies. And many people watching this might think, What's the point of, of talking about this? Uh, sure, it, it's, it's interesting to know what the timeline was. But that said, we knew that they were lying. They knew that they were lying. It doesn't really change anything. But that is actually exactly why I want to cover this. Because we're now, I don't know, I'm not good at math and I'm in a weird fugue state for my fever. But we're like nine months from the last election, 10 months. And uh, we had an insurrection and uh, we have that movement still out there. And like we know that they were lying, but what has actually been done at the state level? Lots of things have been done, but what has been done at the state level to make it less likely that the sorts of claims they were using will result in actual elections being overturned? They've passed tons of bills, every, not every single one of them, but the vast majority have resulted in making it easier for Republicans to take personal control over the elections. They're stuffing state secretary, secretaries of state at the state level with partisan goons. And so I just throw this out there as a reminder to you that we are cruising every day towards more elections that are going to be less secure than the ones that very nearly were overturned back in 2020. And nobody really seems to be taking it seriously. Certainly not anybody that wants to stop elections from being overthrown. That's how it works. You know, you ignore the things that are happening from one particular point of view because of just so many, it's a deluge of things that they throw at you. But no, actual, look for actual legislation to be passed, actual agenda items to be put forward. What is the Republican Party's agenda now trickling down from Donald Trump from 20 is that everything that you vote on is a lie. All elections yeah. are fraudulent. You have to uh, you have to dismiss them in many cases, which they're which I don't know if they really realize this they're doing to their voters. We're telling them not to vote. So then your numbers of voters are gonna go down because they figure the election system is all fraudulent in the first place. So they take up their arms instead, or at least they think they will. It's, this is what you've generated, this is what you've produced from it. And the reason Sidney Powell keeps playing this game is because you know it's like, an actor who was like, you know, who played this iconic role at 20 years old, they're never gonna get another gig again because everyone only remembers her for that. She has to keep playing that role in order to make any money. So let's do the redo of the of the old role back in 20 and do the redo again mm -hmm. and redo again. That's the only way she can continue to make money. She what what is Sydney Powell gonna do with her career now? Let, let's launch into a little discussion about Sydney Powell because Maybe we maybe we disagree about her current status, but we're we're going to talk about it now. Let's launch okay. directly in this video, and then we'll talk. I think what we are dealing with here is pervasive and very very dark. It's organized. It's well funded. It's pure evil. They are willing to kill people, a la Kelly Leffler's aide in Georgia 
who was suddenly blown up in his car on the way to a rally for her. Uh, he happened to be dating Governor Kemp's daughter. Governor Kemp was considering, I think at that point, a signature audit. And then the Georgia Bureau of Investigation agent who was investigating that, he was the lead investigator, was suddenly dead within a week. And suddenly we don't hear anything else about any of that. I find actual true crime stuff kind of boring. The made up stuff is even worse. So what she's referencing there is not 100% made up. Uh, a man named Harrison Deal, a campaign staffer for, for former Senator Leffler, did actually die last December in a three vehicle accident. An Atlanta man was later charged with second degree homicide uh, by vehicle. That's the person she's referring to who was apparently was dating the daughter of the governor. Uh, he was not blown up, there was a car accident, it's tragic. And that actually happens. The, she does, she's not even claiming who supposedly has been assassinating people to do what, by the way, to send a signal to Brian Kemp so he won't do an audit of the results in Georgia, which they did. They did tons of analysis of the results in Georgia. And even if somehow that had changed the result in Georgia, that wouldn't have changed the result of the election. So even if the insane thing, and yes, and Sophie's pointing out, uh, he had no power individually, but I, but I think her point would be that it's a message being sent to Brian Kemp that they'll kill him or whatever. Um, that wouldn't have even overturned the results of the election. So it's a conspiracy theory that uh, pragmatically on the ground doesn't make sense, but even the conclusions don't make sense. But that's Sidney Powell, who was doing press conferences for the president last year. So wait, so where's the point of potential uh, a disagreement here? Like you think Sidney Powell is. Is is really believes it? I'm not sure because you said that I was okay, talking about how point. she has nothing else to but play this role, right? So she knows it's BS. Yes, and I don't disagree with that. The only yeah. disagreement, I guess, is do we think she's still making money off of this? Oh, <laughs> like I feel like it's a more pathetic, like <laughs> I still want you to think that I'm influential thing or something like that. <laughs> I I want to use it to remind people. That this was a high profile member of the former president's legal team. But as of right now, she seems, I mean, are there people who take her seriously? I don't know. Maybe, I wonder, but the, the potential, like, you know, channels of money that could come in from people who need her to say things like this. I don't know, but probably not tons of money. I mean, and also, I don't know how well this lawsuit is going to be going for her and how much that's progressed. Um, but that's, it's, it's, it seems like it's one of those things where she has to, sometimes there's moments maybe in her delusions that she has to insert these kinds of stories or conspiracies to then promote herself enough to then make money at the next appearance or get to that next yeah. uh, a symposium. Or the maybe she's just stretched all the way to 2022 when it becomes more relevant and there's more people listening to her, more of the casual political listeners that aren't just people who analyze it like we do all the time. Whatever it is, she has to stay relevant long enough to continue that gravy trade. Maybe that's the difference. Because maybe yeah. not from this one particular appearance, she's making necessarily money, but she has to continue to have this platform of being Sidney Powell. A lady who works for Donald Trump, who's been telling all the, the truths about 2020. I mean, same with Mike Lindell. He hasn't stopped either, and he, it's 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 continuous. Now he's stretched it to Thanksgiving. They need to keep <laughs> it stretched long enough in order. To, there's you know there's a there's a time frame of money you got. You're like, okay, I got three more months of making money off of this lie. Oh, okay, that three months is ended. Let's push up another two more months. You need yeah. another milestone. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, and really fast, uh, the other uh, murder that she alleged there was that the investigator had been murdered to cover up the other murder that was designed to steal the election by the people who won by oh. millions and millions of votes. Uh, back at that point, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation had tweeted multiple times that the tragic loss of this agent had nothing to do with the election. And they would really appreciate for the family of the deceased if people would stop using them in their conspiracy theories, which reminds me a lot of Seth Rich. Like totally. the family was just desperately begging for people to stop using it for their own political ends, but grifter's gonna grift. So uh, Sidney Powell is on that level. In any event, uh, we are going to roll. Oh, Did we wanna break so early? Okay, well we can. You know what, before we break though, I do wanna remind you cuz I haven't yet. Um, uh, indisputable, as always, will be coming up right after uh, the damage report. David Schuster is going to be joining Dr. Rashad Ritchie. 
Uh, Albert Eisenberg is gonna be on for a debate and that is all available at twitch.tv slash TYT or youtube.com slash indisputable TYT. If you stick around on the damage report stream to watch it, you will not be able to see it. So you have to go to that uh, that uh, channel. And uh, if you wanna show your support for the show, uh, they've got some new merch available at ShopTYT. I've got one right now, the they won't stop, I won't stop shirt. <laughs> and by the way, so yesterday I was wearing the um, I wish a Karen Wood shirt. And uh, while I was waiting to get fleeced by uh, Culver City Toyota, I went to uh, a sandwich shop. And uh, the person who was bringing me up, the worker, uh, like laughed at the shirt and she was like, oh, we have to deal with so many of those. And I was like, <laughs> I bet. <laughs> so anyway, that could, th that could be a popular shirt for even people who don't know the show, potentially. Anyway, with that, why don't we take our second break? And when we come back, we're gonna have a lot more news. Okay, with that, let's see, there's a little bit of me left. We're gonna throw it into this next story, okay. Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook have faced a lot of controversies recently, a lot of recent scandals as well. And they have heard your concerns and they have a strategy now. They're going to try to convince you against your will that they're actually awesome. So how are they gonna do that? Well, Mark Zuckerberg, the chief executive of Facebook, signed off last month on a new initiative codenamed Project Amplify, which totally sounds something like a cyberpunk dystopia, to use Facebook's news feed, the site's most important digital real estate, to show people positive stories about the social network. No, really, they're just going to start putting more positive stories about Facebook on your Facebook feed. Mm. That's their strategy to deal with all this. <laughs> the idea, was that pushing pro Facebook news items, some of them written by the company, that, that even makes it better. They're gonna be writing some of these and then making you look at them. Would improve its image in the eyes of users, according to three people with knowledge. Well, yeah, I sort of assume that's what it was. Um, here's the thing, this is just the most recent attempt for them to get out in front of the many scandals. And when I say many scandals, I mean a lot of things. We're gonna be talking about um, some of their own internal studies about the mental health impact of being on Facebook and Instagram. But also, there have been a lot of worries about the allowances for things like racist speech, vaccine misinformation, the literal organization of the insurrection in the Capitol on Facebook, preferential treatment of right wing news outlets, preferential treatment of individuals like Diamond and Silk. You probably remember that story from last year. And so rather than do something about this, they're gonna push stories in front of you. And not just to improve the image of Facebook. Zuckerberg is also interested in his own personal image. So they also <laughs> reference this, this is a great New York Times write up. So Mr. Zuckerberg, who had become intertwined with policy issues, including the 2020 election, also wanted to recast himself as an innovator. In January, the communications team circulated a document with a strategy for distancing Mr. Zuckerberg from scandals, partly by focusing his Facebook posts and media appearances on new products. So that was back in January. So if you have been occasionally a little bit confused about some of his activity, uh, this might be why. So for instance, when this weird as video came out of him surfboarding with a flag, yeah, that was apparently part of this. And uh, you remember this when Gail Simmons interviewed him in like a, a cartoon or whatever for some virtual virtual reality, nothing that isn't gonna impact any of your lives. No, he's an innovator, guys. It's not that he's working with Jared Kushner and Donald Trump to let them do whatever they want on the platform in, in, in exchange for not getting regulations, which is literally a recent scandal that just came out. He's an innovator. He's coming up with virtual reality doodads and stuff. I don't know, he's JR, do you think I'm being too harsh on him? He is an innovator after all. Uh, well, okay, maybe not too hard on him, but I also don't think this is specific to you. This is just general public in general, because I approach all social media sites with a different, a different a lens. These are websites, and these are people who are trying to make money. And so, you know, why would Facebook be promoting bad things about himself, about him, or about the website? They're trying to survive. They're trying to continually be one of the biggest sites ever made. So, their interests are themselves. And for some reason, many of us just don't get that. Hey, if you go to the Toyota, if you Culver City Toyota website, the website is not gonna say we <laughs> fleece people. 
when they come in for for strut work. They're gonna say, <laughs> we got the best prices in the city. Come and get your struts done. And then you get there, then they fleece you. So for Facebook, it's not gonna be headlines about how horrible Facebook is. It's still a company trying to make money. So they're gonna put things on their website that we think we have control over to say good things about themselves. It's a promotional thing. If you go on anybody's website, they're not gonna promote bad things about themselves. They're gonna promote good things about themselves. Difference is, is these websites may be selling tomatoes and produce at Ralph's, our local mm -hmm. grocery store, and they're not gonna say, hey, our tomatoes suck. They're gonna say they're great. And you might find out they suck later when you get there. <laughs> it's the same thing with Facebook. It's a company trying to make themselves look good when they actually have bad aspects that happen. And we just have to be aware enough to not believe everything they say. A hundred percent. Although I will say, people are gonna be watching these clips and have no idea why we keep referencing Culver <laughs> City. Um, but anyway. Yeah, look, they're, they're gonna Toyota's do what- gonna hate me. <laughs> exactly. Uh, oh, Gail King, I said Gail Simmons. I don't remember how, why I said that, but anyway, Gail King, apologies. Anyway, uh, yeah, they're gonna do what they can to try to protect their reputation. Look, there, there's a couple of good reasons, I guess, to still be on Facebook. It's possible you have photos from back in like 2007. That's the only place they exist. Alternatively, watching the damage report. Other than those two things, there ain't no reason to be on Facebook at this point or any of them, honestly. Every time I press enter on a tweet, I think, why? Seriously, why? But anyway, <laughs> let's talk about some of the other negative impacts that have been revealed recently. So Wall Street Journal did this great report, a couple different stories that are available in the Wall Street Journal, looking into some of the internal analyses that Facebook has done on what impact being on its platforms has on a bunch of different types of people, especially teen girls. So they found a slide from one Facebook presentation back in 2019 that said, quote, we make body image issues worse for one in three teen girls. Another read, teens blame Instagram for increases in the rate of anxiety and depression. And they zeroed in on selfies, particularly filtered ones that allow users to touch up their faces. Quote, sharing or viewing filtered selfies in stories made people feel worse because of course they did. Now, they're not stopping that, they're not stopping that at all. But they do know and have known for a couple of years the mental health toll in terms of body image and all of that anxiety and depression that being these problems will have on people. Yeah, well, I mean. I don't know if they knew it beforehand, but as we already know, they can study and figure these things out. But again, it's from their perspective. It's like not their problem, dude. Like yeah. if you think there's not gonna be a new site that filters the way people see things, it's not gonna pop up and makes people happy to see themselves in different light or a different filter in this case, it'll be there. So they're like, hey, we see how it affects people, but it's just not our job to fix people. And to a degree, maybe we need some kind of help or some kind of assistance or some kind of resources that are available for people to not have to think their life really does exist on Instagram. Because yeah. I enjoy all these sites. Actually, I really hate Facebook, but I enjoy many of these sites. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so far still holding off on TikTok. But it's a whole thing where it's just, if you see what you're getting yourself into and understand it for what it is, you can be okay, but there's just too many younger folks that just don't. It's too important. It's all yeah. they've seen. It's all they've known in their lives. So yeah, I look. I we're gonna go into a few more of these, but really fast. Um, I I don't. I, I use Facebook a tiny little bit. I used to use the Messenger or whatever, but like mm -hmm. yeah, now I do other stuff. But um, I used to really like Instagram, and they made one change that I've complained about on the show before, oh. and they know what they did, and they will not change it. Do you know what it is? <laughs> um, I don't know, man. Jeez, I don't want to be the wrong one. No, it's the, they will not allow you to just have things pop up in the order that they show up. They have to curate it, they do their algorithm. It used to be you could have a chronological timeline. Uh -huh. Things show up in the order they show up. And they show up in the amount that people upload them. Well, but you mean like, you you'll you'll like, like, like if, you, if I go on Instagram right now, the most recent post might be from yesterday. Because they think that's the one I should see rather than the one that was just put up recently. Now, you could do either of those two things. You could allow people to just follow who they want and get the posts when they're posted, but that like respects them as individuals and assumes that they're making intentional choices. Or you can make it all about the algorithm, and that's how you get a bunch of this stuff because they're choosing ones they think you should want. They're encouraging you to see these things. They're boosting certain types of content and not others. It's all BS. What would save 
to a large degree, a lot of this stuff is just getting rid of the damn algorithms. Like you don't need to figure out what percentage of like I follow MKBHD on on YouTube. Just send me his videos when he posts them. And if he posts too many, I'll stop following him. It's not on you to decide whether I need to see 30% of them or 60% of them. I follow the people that I want to follow them and I want to see their videos when they post them. These are very simple things, but you don't sell a bunch of ads and you don't do all the stuff that they want from a business perspective by focusing on the algorithm. So maybe the, the whole point then being, you know, they want to make sure people don't, um, you know, they don't miss something from their person they want. Or if you do like this, I stuff, then so you, then much you from this. Hit the ringer. Because by the time it's up, it's like too, I feel creepy commenting on some of the <laughs> stuff they post for me because it's too old. So if I ever comment on your old stuff, that's why. It's the algorithm. <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, sure, sure. Yeah, but look, they, they, they have there are serious issues that have been revealed. Everyone watching this, we got we got to move on. But you should definitely check out the Wall Street Journal analysis and the New York Times write up. Um, about the, their strategy to push pro Facebook news in front of you. Uh, Zuckerberg responded to it. And to give you an idea of how seriously he's taking this, uh, they criticized that photo of him on a surfboard. And he responded to that saying they were spreading fake news because it was actually a paddleboard. <laughs> Don't screw yourself, Mark Zuckerberg, honestly. <laughs> like you are wrecking, people are committing suicide in no small part thanks to the pressure that's put on them by all this BS. And he's making jokes about wakeboards and stuff. We gotta jump right into this, so uh, hold on to your butts. There's gonna be parts of this you won't like, but we're gonna jump into this video. C. Pelosi is sneaking the Green New Deal into the $3.5 trillion budget. And in 2022, I'm going to blow away the Democrat socialist agenda. Below and sign up to win my 50 caliber. Yeah, uh, there, there might still be some sweat on it from where it hit her from the recoil because she apparently had no idea what she was doing with that rifle. <laughs> anyway, uh, look, there's a lot of issues here. There's the poser stuff, JR. There's the political violence stuff. Right. We're gonna blow away the socialists. That's great. What do you think of this? We've seen this many times. Politicians always have their 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 web or their campaign ad where they're shooting a gun at a bill, a stack of bills. Oh, look at all this red tape. I'm gonna shoot up the bureaucracy and I'm gonna blow up a car. Let's look at the other uh, the other part of that of those images there too. It's a Prius, which you guys know I complain about Priuses all the time, but. We know we connect Priuses to, you know, those rich yep. uh, uh, libs out in California, New York, driving their uh, environmentally friendly cars. You know, it's not a Hummer, it's not a, an F-350 truck. You know, that's yeah. not what they're blowing up. They're blowing up the Prius, which, by the way, it, you know, if you get the full electric ones, then you know they don't have any gas in them anyway. Anyways. <laughs> 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 the whole idea is to point out this division of who we are versus who they are and look at the violence I can pull on them. Don't you want this big gun so you can go shooting up some Priuses too? Come on, yep. man. Come on. 100%. It is just, and, and she's giving that gun to someone. So someone's gonna watch that and be like, yeah, blow away the socialists. Give me a gun. I wanna blow away the socialists. Also, does she own a shirt with sleeves? Somebody needs to look into this. Maybe Ken Klippenstein can. <laughs> but anyway, um, it was just, it was such cringy posing. Yeah. It, like the video they did of how long it took her to put her sight on it and then it's moving and they've, they've like after effects in some circling things yeah. around it. If you really love these guns, why, like, does it not bother you that they're totally faking it? And if that's the take they went with, where she couldn't control the recoil and hit herself in the face, what were the takes they didn't use? How bad must those have looked? The entire <laughs> thing is being a poser. And the only thing that makes it worse is that she's being a poser to try to appeal to people who want to see their political opponents get murdered. That is what she is directly appealing to. I would love to see a video of Ilhan Omar firing a oh. rocket launcher oh. at an F-150 oh. and see what they think about that. I have oh. a feeling they'd have a problem with it. And so I would too. Uh, and she was in the back of a truck too. She was in the back of a pickup shooting. These are all very deliberate imagery. Yeah, 100% pathetic. Anyway, um, okay, 
Uh, we are unfortunately out of time in our first hour. So if you're on one of our linear platforms, thank you so much for watching. But for Twitch and YouTube, we do have more news coming for you, including some of the worst races around the country. It'll be a fun roundup coming to you after this. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.